that song still makes him feel the same way it did when he wrote it. Often he'll wake up out of a sleep and go down to the studio and go to record. And I think that was one of those songs where it was on his mind. A decade after Prince first performed Purple Rain, his drummer Michael Bland remembers the music icon still being in love with his signature song. The incendiary rock ballad would serve as the epic closer for the legendary Purple Rain tour. Prince's musical voyage from 1984 to 1985 ranks as one of the greatest concerts of all time and took the Midwest by storm with a secret show in Cincinnati, a seven-night opening in Detroit, and an unforgettable two-night showcase at Richfield Coliseum. I'm Troy L. Smith, reporter for Cleveland.com. You're listening to CLE Rocks, the music podcast from the birthplace of rock and roll. On this episode, we revisit the magic of Prince's Purple Rain Tour. Hello, Cleveland! Prince Rogers Nelson earned his commercial breakthrough with 1982's 1999, an album that reached the top 10 on the charts and spawned three hit singles, including Little Red Corvette, Delirious, and the celebratory title track that has since become one of Prince's most recognizable songs. However, it was Purple Rain, both the album and the film, that arrived in the summer of 1984 that would take Prince, one of the most unique figures in music, to the next level, remembers journalist Gary Graff. I mean, he was huge. You know, he was as big as, if not bigger than Taylor Swift, you know, could be could be seen now for for so many uh, sociological reasons just about how how music was consumed. You know, at at that time, it was a it was easier for back then for an artist to have a monolithic presence. You know, whether it was Michael Jackson, Springsteen, uh, Prince at the time than it is now, just across the board. You know, even if it wasn't your kind of music, you knew this was a big freaking star. And so Prince was at the very top of that game, and you know, he really was part of a a big three. Um, in 1984, it was it was Michael Bruce and then Prince. And in a lot of ways, Prince, you know, Prince was me the most credible. Prince had mystery on his side. You know, Bruce did a, did a few interviews. Bruce had a bigger a bigger presence. Michael Jackson had a much bigger presence. Prince, you only kind of knew about this guy from the movie and the records, and he wasn't doing interviews, and so you had, you know, Rolling Stone and Time and, and People and, you know, the mainstream media trying to get inside this guy who wouldn't play ball with them. I think that that era of mystery gave him a different kind of persona and a different kind of credibility. Prince would release When Doves Cry, the lead single from Purple Rain, on May 16, 1984. Within two months, the song would work its way to number one on the Billboard Hot 100, remaining there for five weeks, during which time Prince's musical odyssey Purple Rain would hit theaters. Will you help me? Nope. Pardon me? Nope. Want to know why? Nope. Because you wouldn't pass the initiation. What initiation? Well, for starters, you have to purify yourself in the waters of Lake Minnetonka. Thanks to Prince's rising star power, Purple Rain would go on to earn $70 million at the box office, blowing away the movie's modest expectations. Two more massive singles from Purple Rain, including Let's Go Crazy and the unforgettable title track, would set the stage for the Purple Rain tour. The tour would sell a whopping 1.7 million tickets, selling out the overwhelming majority of venues well ahead of time. However, Prince's busy schedule allowed for just a few weeks of rehearsals for himself, his band The Revolution, and openers Apollonia 6 and Sheila E. Elaborate choreography and custom-made outfits would lead to marathon practice sessions. With the tour just six weeks out, 
Prince looked for a venue to hold a dress rehearsal. He would wind up choosing storied concert venue Bogarts, located in the Coryville neighborhood of Cincinnati, Ohio. Prince was no stranger to the club, having performed there in 1980 and visited in 1982 for a show featuring his hero, James Brown, and Wilson Pickett, who calls Bogart's owner, Al Porkalab. He came in really low-key. I actually didn't know until my production manager said, you know Prince is in the house? <laughs> Come on. They said, no, he's here. And, and I believe he came in the back through the uh, you know, stage door entrance. Uh, someone on uh, James Brown's uh, you know, staff brought him in because I certainly didn't know it. And at that time, certainly if he had come in the front of the house, everybody would have been saying, hey, you know, Prince is here. The show at Bogart's was a secret. The team at the venue could not promote it as a Prince concert in order to avoid a frenzy. Thus, the venue went to extreme measures to keep things under wraps. We were told, you know, certainly not to tell anybody, not to really tell other than management. I don't think the staff knew. There were, we, I think we dis disabled you know, the pay phone at that time we had a pay phone. None of the none of the phones in, that management had were to be used. And it was being promoted at that time on the air by a radio station. I'm not sure if the call letters are still the same, uh, W B L Z. And and I'm I it's been some years ago, but I think they were uh, promoting it as the red, white and blue tour. No mention of prints, no mention of anything uh, but it was uh, it was five dollars to get in. Somehow the word got out. My understanding, the word got out uh, that it was you know Prince, and of course you know it was it was sold out in a heartbeat. But some people still didn't know. I'll never forget standing there when he came out, and you know it was like kind of backlit. He wasn't facing the audience. And they, I for, forget what song he was playing, but I remember vividly as if it was yesterday. This one girl says to her friend, he said, look at that guy trying to be Prince. And the girl looks at her and says, you idiot, that is Prince. <laughs> the concert was a full-on dress rehearsal, with Prince and the Revolution in full attire, performing the majority of the set that would make up the Purple Rain tour. The concert, held in front of 1,500 people, remains one of the most surreal moments in music history. You know, it was one of the great all-time shows at the club. Uh, I mean, everybody was there. You know, Apollonia, Jerome, uh, Morris Day. I mean, they were all there. I mean, and to see them in, in, in really uh, a small setting was, was very unique at the time because he was. He was a superstar. He was a megastar. And, you know, very, very nice, very quiet. Didn't say much, but he was really an artiste. He was back there with the sound guys checking the levels, which, you know, most <laughs> artists won't do. I mean, he, he, every detail, nothing escaped his attention. With the Bogart show behind them, Prince and the Revolution would gear up for the Purple Rain tour, which was set to begin with seven sold-out nights at Detroit's Joe Louis Arena. Jim McFarlane, a Detroit News staff reporter who covered the shows, remembers the tour opening creating a level of excitement in the city that was unheard of. We thought we were the epicenter of the rock and roll slash music world. And I think we might have been, actually. Prince had a very strong love affair with Detroit. Next to Minneapolis, it was his favorite city. I think there are a couple of reasons for that. One was a late-night disc jockey, uh, Charles Johnson, also known as the Electrifying Mojo, who uh, had a very popular, although almost invisible, show on a very low-power R&B station on the main street in Detroit. And he turned Detroit on to Prince. I think before anybody else. And Prince became aware of that. Uh, the other reason is that there was a guy named Billy Sparks who was um, a black promoter in Detroit. He uh, promoted Prince's early shows. I think there are at least two of those reasons, the reasons why Prince really loved Detroit. And we were honored and shocked and very proud that he was doing seven. I mean, think about that. Who could do seven nights anywhere today? What artist could do a seven-night sold-out set in any city today? I, there may be a couple, but most of those I can think of have passed away. Um, so we were, yeah, we were, uh, we were pretty cocky, quite frankly. We uh, we had friends for a week, and y'all did.
Prince's storied relationship with Detroit, a utopia of black music history, was on full display during the opening night, as Prince took time out from his father's song piano interlude to thank the crowd for its attendance. Such an interaction was unheard of for the enigmatic performer. I was shocked because he, I mean, he was a showman of the first degree. He did his show. He didn't necessarily communicate with the crowd in terms of physical contact. I mean, he communicated through his music and through his dance moves and through his persona. But he didn't, you know, take that time like a lot of performers do to sit and go, well, people, I'm so glad you're here and thanks for coming. He did that on the first night, and I just almost fell off the chair because that was so out of character for him. I, but I think it, it indicates the kind of feeling he had for Detroit and Detroit fans. I think he, in many ways he felt that Detroit and his hometown were the place that kind of pulled him to the success he had. And just coming off the movie, coming off Purple Rain, he could do no wrong. So the fact that he would choose Detroit and the fact he'd be so intimate with the audience in that way was just incomprehensible. It was mind-bending. The Purple Rain tour also showcased a more mature side of Prince. While still fueled by his cosmic sexuality, including the famous When Doves Cry bathtub, the track was a far cry from his early career performances that included R-rated dance moves and him, at times, wearing nothing more than a G-string and stockings. It almost was like he scaled himself back a little bit. He's almost, he almost became the PG version of himself because when he toured before, I mean, you had to you know, put blindfolds on your little kids. I mean, he was gyrating and dancing and half naked, and then now he comes on after Purple Rain, and he's like fully dressed. I wouldn't say he's conservative, but compared to what he was doing before, there's pre-Purple Rain and post-Purple Rain. And the post-Purple Rain print was all markedly so much more discreet, so much less sexual and sensual. While the shows in Detroit would prove monumental, they were the start of a new concert setup for Prince. Gary Graff, who also covered both the first and final concerts in Detroit, remembers those shows having their hiccups. I really felt like the two shows I saw that first week of the tour, it was almost like they were recreating the video Prince on stage and not letting that, you know, ferocious kinetic performer loose. You know, it just felt it just felt like you know they, these were video vignettes being recreated on a stage rather than a concert. It wasn't all that it would become, and it certainly it certainly missed the kind of looseness and I guess what we call the daring do that we'd seen him do before on the 1999 tour, the controversy tour. By the time Prince made his way to Richfield Coliseum for a two-night stand on December 5th and 6th, all the kinks had been worked out. Richfield hosted everyone from Billy Joel and Kiss to Van Halen and Rush, but nothing was bigger than Prince's Purple Rain Tour, which attendee Heidi Dolan says rivaled even that of Bruce Springsteen's 1984 Born in the USA run. Oh my God, it was insane. First of all, like to get the tickets was unbelievably ridiculous you know and this was the days where you had to go stand in line at like a drug mart and like hope that by the time you got to the front they still had tickets there were no wristbands there was no online the internet didn't exist you know it was like the hottest thing in town it was completely sold out people were just totally hyped and like half the school was going to be there it was just it was insane people were just dying for this concert prince was as big as springsteen and michael jackson in 1984 However, unlike those two accessible performers, Prince was quite an enigma, both as an artist and as a man. He was clearly, you know, one of those people who was like a musical savant. He could play like 17 instruments and he could do it well. And he also wrote his own music. But also at that time, that was really kind of the beginning, at least where I live, where it was like mixed race couples, right? And like, what was Prince? Was he white or was he black? Well, you know, was he mixed? 
asked, was he, you know, like Puerto Rican? Like, what was he? Nobody really knew, but it wasn't anything we ever really pursued. But it was kind of like this ambiguous race. So, like, the white kids liked him. The black kids liked him. Everybody kind of liked him. Then, of course, he had very provocative lyrics. And when you're 16 years old, you listen to music that talks about sex. Wow, that's like, you know, you just think you're the hottest thing ever. You know, and then he was like kind of mysterious. Like he didn't want to give interviews. And he always had that coy little smile on his face. And like, what was he thinking? And, you know, he created his own like it was like a, a whole fantasy world that he lived in. And everybody kind of wanted a piece of it. With Prince's popularity at an all time high. The first sold-out night at Richfield would prove a flawless showcase. The arena was dark, and they went on stage without lighting anything, and then it starts in with the... Everyone went absolutely nuts, just screaming and yelling and clapping and just losing their minds in general. It just kind of went up from there, you know, like, it was so remarkable. You know, you've got, like, this big star coming to, like, the middle of this country, concrete palace, doing the, doing his thing, and it was super cool. Prince wasn't the only exciting persona on stage during the Purple Rain tour. His band was decked out in the colorful outfits people had seen in the film and could recognize. Sheila E. was also a highlight, both during her own set with her band and while jamming on stage with Prince. But as Graf points out, Prince was always the centerpiece. He was just dynamic. You know, you're, you know, even though he had a big band and a big stage show, you didn't look at anything else but Prince the entire time he was on stage. Yeah, there was there was no question. I mean, he could dance, like you say. You know, certainly came from the James Brown school of hyperkinetics. Uh, you know, and and you know, great singer, great guitar player. Uh, he he knew he also knew how to perform. You know, regardless of the size of the room, he knew, he knew what to do. He 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 understood and worked with the best lighting people. So his his vision, his presence filled a big arena. But interestingly, the presence was Prince. It was the backlit spotlights that silhouetted him against the arena wall or or against the back. Everything was done to focus to focus on Prince, and that that was a you know a very important part of the show. You know, you might look at Lisa or Wendy or Dr. Fink for a second, but you never ever took your eyes off Prince. The Purple Rain tour would run for 98 shows. Madonna and Bruce Springsteen would famously join Prince on stage during a February 23, 1985 concert. The March 30th show in Syracuse, New York would be recorded and released on VHS later that year. Fittingly, the Purple Rain tour would conclude with a 20-minute version of Prince's legendary title track. Thank you for listening to this episode of CLE Rocks. For more, visit our page on Acast, Apple, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform. I'm Troy L. Smith. Until next time.